Welcome everyone. My name is Laura O'Brien and I'm the UN Advocacy Officer at Access Now. It is a true honor to welcome you today for an important and a timely discussion on structural racism, police violence, and the right to protest. We all look forward to what will be a very compelling discussion with an esteemed group of panelists. Before getting started, we would like to thank those who made this event possible, our co-organizers and our co-sponsors, Foley Hoeg, the ACLU, Access Now, International Service for Human Rights, Leitner Center for International Law and Justice at Fordham Law School, U.S. Human Rights Network, and International Human Rights Clinic at USC Gold School of Law. Before handing it off to my co-moderator, Christina Hureyes from Foley Hoeg, I want to provide a brief overview of the event. We'll be online for the next 90 minutes. It is a panel discussion followed by a Q&A with the audience. While we have an open chat function for the audience to engage, we request that participants write in their questions and, and the speaker they would like to pose them to in the Q&A function, which is located at the bottom of the screen. Finally, a kind reminder that this event will be recorded and broadcasted live on ISHR's YouTube channel. With all that said, I now hand it off to Christina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. It's really such a pleasure to be moderating, co-moderating the panel here today, bringing together leading academics, experts, practitioners, and activists to look at the issue of systemic racism and the freedom of expression through the lens of international law. The extrajudicial killing of George Floyd and the efforts to suppress the Black Lives Matter protests against systemic racism and violence against people of African descent have galvanized a global response. Last June, the families of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Michael Brown, Philandro Castle, together with over 650 civil society organizations, called on the United Nations Human Rights Council to convene a special session to respond to the situation of escalating human rights abuses in the United States. They sought the creation of an independent commission of inquiry into uh, recent extrajudicial killings of police, of people by, of African descent in the United States as well as allegations of excessive use of force against peaceful protesters and journalists in the demonstrations in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. In response, the Human Rights Council held an urgent debate on systemic racism and police brutality, which resulted in Resolution 43-1, which, one, condemns racial discrimination, discrimination law enforcement practices and structural racism in the criminal justice system, as well as the recent incidents of excessive force against peaceful demonstrators. And two, request that the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights prepare a report on systemic racism and violations of international law against Africans and people of African descent by law enforcement agencies, especially those incidents that resulted in the death of George Floyd. And three, request that the High Commissioner examine government responses to anti-racism peaceful protests, including alleged use of excessive force. Today's discussion will consider the global impact of systemic racism and law enforcement brutality, exploring the lack of accountability for police violence and the importance of the freedom of expression and assembly across the globe on these issues. It's my pleasure to introduce the panelists for today's discussion. Because time is short, we won't go through their bios, but you'll all be quite familiar with them because they're the leading voices on these issues. We begin with Thelonis Floyd, the brother of George Floyd, victim of police violence. Ben Crump, legal counsel to the family of George Floyd, can no longer join us, but we're very for fortunate to welcome Jasmine Rand, international legal and media strategist for the George Floyd legal team former attorney for Trayvon Martin and the Michael Brown families, and annual teaching faculty in trial advocacy at Harvard Law. We're also joined by Professor Gay McDougall, distinguished scholar in residence at the Leitner Center on International Law and Justice at Fordham University School of Law. She's also the former vice chair of, international, of the UN Committee for the Elimination of Discri Racial Discrimination and the former UN Special Rapporteur on Minorities. 
We're also joined by Professor Clement Voulet, United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Freedom of Peaceful Assembly and Association and a fellow at the Geneva Academy. And lastly, Mr. Jamil Dakwar, who's the director of the ACLU's Human Rights Program. Before joining the ACLU in 2004, he worked for Human Rights Watch. He's also currently an adjunct professor at Hunter College and John Jay College of Criminal Justice. I'd now like to turn it over for introduction from Professor Tendia Achume for her welcoming, welcoming remarks. Professor Achume is a professor of law at UCLA School of Law. She's also the UN Special Rapporteur on Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance. Thank you. So it's, it's really a privilege to be invited to provide opening remarks um, for a gathering such as, as this one, and it couldn't be more timely. And I just have to apologize that I have to step off of the call fairly soon because I'll be addressing the General Assembly um, later this afternoon. So as um, our moderators highlighted, this summer racial justice advocates made history leading local, national, and then transnational uprisings opposing systemic racism and dehumani dehumanization and degradation of black lives and black bodies all over the world. And I think it's not an exaggeration to say, to say that these movements really shook the world and that these movements shook the world in a way that actually reverberated at the level of the UN Human Rights Council, which I think was a phenomenal feat. And as we heard, you know, advocacy organizations, including ones that are represented on this, pa on this panel, uh, Mr. Floyd, who's on this panel, some of the people who are in this conversation were central to bringing these issues to the attention um, of the Human Rights um, Council. The outcome of the urgent debate was disappointing to say the least. At a time when we were experiencing unprecedented numbers out in the streets demanding radical change, um, the demand I think for a commission of inquiry was a very powerful one which the Human Rights Council shied away from, instead requesting that the High Commissioner produce a report um, along the lines that were highlighted earlier. I think the outcome of the Human Rights Council one, they highlight the fundamental important, importance of movements and civil society actors in pushing um, racial justice. Um, and I think they also highlight something more depressing, which is that when we talk about systemic racism, nations as well, where you can have um, such a powerful movement nonetheless result in an outcome that was weaker than people had um, asked for. I think the outcome of the Human Rights Council urgent debate really speaks to the urgency of conversations and actions like the ones that people in this panel um, are involved in. And they really highlight that the fight to remake our societies on more equal terms is a long-term fight. It's an intergenerational fight and one that cannot be left to nation states and their multilateral institutions alone. They really require serious investment by, in some cases, those people who are actually most um, affected by the structures of injustice. And so I think having spaces such as these ones to be able to talk and strategize about ways forward is absolutely um, essential. And, and so I want to take the, the moment to thank all of you who are panelists in this conversation, many of you, as I mentioned, who are central to bringing about the conversation in the um, Human Rights Council and hope that um, the energy that you showed in that context will continue and also thank many of our participants who I think are also very much engaged in that fight as well. I'll end there and really look forward to watching the video because I think there's going to be some very interesting um, reflections and, and thoughts shared with you all today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, for those excellent remarks and for joining us today and for all that you're doing on issues of racial justice at the UN. It's really a pleasure to have you here today. Um, I'd like to now open it up to the presenters, uh, beginning with Mr. Uh. Floyd. Um, each presenter will just take five minutes to um, introduce their position, and then we'll go into the Q&A phase. Hello? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I could barely hear you because the stuff was fuzzy on her. I'm, I'm, I'm asking what... what 
I could barely hear what she just said. It was fuzzy on my end. Oh, okay. Um, sorry, I, I just mentioned that um, each speaker will have five minutes just to mm -hmm. briefly present uh, your introduction to the issue from your perspective, and then we'll okay. go into Q&A. Okay. So if you could just take five minutes to introduce okay. your perspective. Um, Thank you. Well, uh, me personally, uh, everything that's going on right now in this world, uh, it's, it's chaos. My brother, he didn't deserve that. When you look at everything with Breonna Taylor, um, Ahmaud Arbery, uh, it's so many different guys and women who didn't go viral. And you're looking at their point of view when you name people like Antonio Gonzalez, Jay Anderson Jr., Alvin Cole. I was just in Chicago and they were all killed by the same police officer who was still on the force, but they just laid him off for pay. Uh, it's, it's a lot of people with pain going on. Uh, me, it was Brian, Tamika Taylor, uh, Jacob Blake. We all just did uh, an episode, a little segment with ABC talking about different things of how police brutality needs to be improved. And it's just a lot of different things. We, it's a lot of people hurt because I know the people on this panel, they understand what I'm talking about, but they don't actually know how it feels because you have a loved one who passes away and you can never get them back. Four and five hours of sleep every night. When that officer kneeled on my brother's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds, he was still on his neck three minutes after he took his last breath. My brother narrated his death like a cinema movie. And every time I look up, someone is always asking me about it. Uh, I go down the street, some people plan it. Uh, YouTube, anywhere, it doesn't matter. It is a staple right now because my brother, George Floyd, Brianna Taylor and Jacob Blake, their household names now. Tragic, it's a tragedy. And I'm glad you all gave me the opportunity to speak on this panel because I've been at polls, different places every day from different states trying to get people to vote. If you can see the shirt, Black Voters Matter, trying my best to get people out because people have to understand their life depends on it. Everybody, their life depends on it. It really does. Um, pretty much, I don't know what else to say. Cause like I was telling you, I could barely understand. It wasn't the first, it was the other lady. I could barely understand what was going on because the computer was going in and out on my end. Um, no, th thank you very much for, for sharing those very personal remarks. Mm -hmm. really heartbreaking and and it's so important for us to all hear directly from the family members of victims so thank you for being so brave and for speaking out and for promoting democracy and getting out the vote and you're really a, tr a true hero for everything that you're doing so thank you thank you so much I want to turn it over to Jasmine now to uh, share some remarks from the perspective of representing victims families yeah, so I think it's really important the work that that we do um, as attorneys on behalf of these families is supported by the movements and protest and the disseminating of these important messages across the globe. So I'm thankful for um, the platform to really be able to discuss how these larger issues work in tandem with the support of these social justice movements um, that arise and really push the legal gamut within our, our law system to create better laws and, and greater social change. And so I think the United States um, really since its inception has been struggling with the issue of, of structural racism. 
And the way that's been coming out, I can't even say recently, the way it's been coming out for probably over a hundred years now is in the realm of law enforcement and with all of the, the cases involving police brutality. And so I think it's very important to fight against police brutality and structural racism, but also to look at the larger context and the broader scope here that racism is so prolific and, and police brutality is so prolific within the United States that it's really um, compounded and led to a, an increase in, in white vigilante behavior. And I don't really think we can talk about the context of police brutality without also talking about the context of what that means in terms of empowering um, ordinary US citizens to commit these horrific acts uh, against black and brown people. And, you know, you, we have, I've worked on a lot of these cases with Benjamin Crump and, you know, I apologize that he's not here today. Many of you see the work that he does um, all over the country. And unfortunately today he had to go to, to a hearing and with, with an increase in, in these cases occurring on almost a daily basis now, his schedule is often thrown off by another family in need and another victim of police brutality. And so I know he, the, the work that you all are doing is so important um, to him and he wishes that he could, he could be here today, but has asked me to speak in his place. And so I've worked on a lot of these cases with Ben, including the Michael Brown case. I've worked on Tamir Rice's case. Most recently, I've been working the international strategy um, for, for the George Floyd legal team to combat these issues of police brutality throughout the country and to really draw not just national attention, but global awareness and bringing the issues with the support of organizations like the ACLU um, to the forefront of the United, uh, United Nations consideration um, because this issue has become not just a regional or domestic issue, it's, it's become a global um, pandemic that we need to, to deal with and to address um, as global citizens. And as I said, a lot of this behavior um, has empowered white vigilantism, like we saw with George Zimmerman, like we saw with the men that killed Ahmaud Arbery um, in Georgia. And we see a very close working relationship between police departments and let's say neighborhood watch associations that give ordinary citizens the power to police each other. And when you have deeply embedded racism within a society, that racism is going to rise up through these individuals who have this quasi police power like George Zimmerman and like the people that killed um, Ahmaud Aubrey. And so I think it's important to kind of look at that issue from that twofold perspective. And I also think that we can't underestimate the power um, that hate speech and hate symbolism has right now in, in the United States. And I think it's important to understand that this message and calling for this type of behavior is really coming from the top down. It's coming from the commander in chief. And I think that a lot of the statements that President Trump has made have been, they haven't really been addressed and they've been swept under the rug in the midst of all of these other things that we're dealing with in the midst of the pandemic and, and the actual shootings themselves. But I think that his behavior, his language is very dangerous. Um, you know, I think saying, you know, telling white supremacist organizations to stand down and stand by that type of speech has consequences. That type of speech puts people at danger. And we see that those speech patterns um, reiterated by local police chiefs. For example, there's a, a police chief in Florida who told his constituency basically shoot first, ask questions later, um, using the terms them and they, which have traditionally been associated with you know, black and brown people. And so I think we need to kind of look at the fact that um, this extreme behavior, police brutality is, re is really being called upon from the top down. And I think that that's also led to a resurgence of this extreme behavior at the ground level. And so there are a lot of different activities happening within the United States that aren't even being examined fully now because of, again, everything else that's, that's happening. But we've seen an increase in unexplained lynchings that people are attributing to suicide um, and you know, everyday violence directed at, at black and brown people. And I think a lot of that stems, like I said, from the fact that we, we don't have good direction coming from the top down. We don't hold people accountable. Um, you know, there's very little local state and federal accountability when a black or brown person is killed by a police officer. And until we have more accountability, we're gonna see an increase in 
um, this type of behavior from police officers directed at citizens, but also from citizens directed at each other. Um, and so I think it's really important that we continue to combat this, that we continue to look at things like independent prosecutions, um, independent medical examiners is another thing that's really important. Um, from my position, someone being on the ground that does the work, oftentimes we see uh, you know, police officers and, and local chiefs um, trying to justify a use of force. And then we have a medical examiner issuing a report uh, you know, basically amening the, the conduct of the police. And I have an example, we all saw what happened with, with Mr. Floyd's brother uh, recently, George Floyd. And, you know, the first medical examiner said there was no sign of asphyxiation outside of, you know, the nine minute video we have of an officer kneeling on, uh, on George Floyd's neck. And, you know, I had another, another case that was equally as egregious in Florida where a police officer ran over uh, an undocumented Haitian person, hit him, killed him, and uh, the medical examiner listed the cause of death as intoxication because the gentleman had had a beer. And so we see that type of behavior really all over the country where we have medical examiners covering uh, for local police departments. And that's why in addition to having an independent prosecution set up, it's very important to have independent medical examinations. And that's been done um, in the state of New York before they've set up independent medical examinations where one or, one or two uh, independent medical examiners have to review autopsy findings of a local government. Um, and so I think that we have to continue to look at these reform, um, combat uh, things like qualified immunity. And it breaks my heart to say this because I'm a former union organizer, but even looking at what you know, the, the power collective bargaining has given to, to police unions and their ability to really protect this type of police behavior. Um, and as a proponent of unions, again, it hurts me to say that, but you know, every system that we put to work for good can, and many of us know, can be used for evil. And I think that there's a real abuse of power happening within unions and, and union members not holding each other accountable. So, you know, I thank you for your opportunity to, to speak today and um, thank Mr. Floyd for, for his remarks as well on behalf of the family. Thank you very much for offering this insight from the perspective of advocating for victims and identifying some areas for possible reform. We're definitely going to get back to that um, at, the, at the end of the discussion or towards the end of the discussion. Uh, but that's actually a really great segue into the remarks of Professor McDougall, who can offer us the perspective of um, looking at the issue of systemic racism from the perspective of international law. Yeah, well, first of all, I want to say thank you for uh, having me here. Thank you for holding um, this. This is a time when we've all got to be talking about these issues. Um, I want to thank Jasmine uh, for um, actually touching all of the important points um, that, uh, uh, that we need to have uh, in mind. Um, you know, the thing that I think that is um, uh, foremost in my mind is that we not in any way separate the, um, the reality of uh, structural racism from you know, what happened to George Floyd and all of the other uh, people. You know, this started back in 1619, when they brought the first uh, enslaved person to these shores, um, you know, it is something that has happened to black uh, men at every era since then. First slave said no, you know, uh, the murders uh, started uh, through the era of uh, the runaway slaves and organized uh, revolts through, you know, emancipation. Uh, through uh, the black coats and uh, you know Jim Crow, you know it, it, it has been as much a tradition in this country, uh, you know, as much about this country as apple pie, you know, killing uh, black men and women uh, that are unarmed and have done no provocation except to say no. Um, so we can't, you know, we can't separate it and we shouldn't separate it. And I've seen so many situations like this before, you know, uh, that we've gone through a period of reckoning and we take the easy way out. Now the easy way out here for us 
and and I think that uh, uh, there'll be a lot of pressure for this is to focus on uh, some police reforms, you know, um, and you could pull out a drawer and it would be full of police reform ideas that have been uh, developed in this country over the past 100 years. Um, and, but we got to focus on why none of that works. And none of that works because the issue is not policing per se, it's racism. You know, we have got to address this head on uh, policing, uh, yes, the, uh, uh, the power of police uh, in this country have been, have been used as a way of, um, what shall I say? Uh, well, it starts with keeping the slaves and, and, and the natives in check. But it's also, I think, uh, more recently, and you see this when you look into the eyes of that policeman with his knee on uh, George's uh, neck. Because um, you got to wonder, what is it that allows this human being to do that to another human being? You know, I, I think that our society has also allowed, uh, you know, this sort of jackboot policing to be a way of sort of like a, um, a, a pressure valve, you know, uh, because there are a lot of other things going on that are wrong in this country and uh, that white uh, working class people have been led to I uh, have always actually been led to uh, place it uh, on, you know, the backs of black people. This is not a country that has taken um, a, a look at its citizens and says, yes, we're going to serve you. So, you know, we have a lot to deal with and, you know, deciding upon another way to do community policing. I'm sorry, this ain't it. There's a lot we could talk about there. I'm not saying it would be wrong to develop some ideas there, uh, but uh, we've got to draw the line all the way back to systemic you know, structural racism um, as a way out of this, uh, not um, you know, community police or some form or not. So that, that, that's my, but as to international law, hey, that's also, we got a lot of them, <laughs> you know. Um, look, we got the International Convention on Elimination of Racial Discrimination. It is thorough, it is comprehensive, um, it goes beyond anything else uh, in international law. Uh, uh, states are required to condemn uh, racism, to not practice it in any uh, form uh, that or uh, manifestation, uh, to uh, not sponsor, not defend or support racial discrimination in any way, to not allow organizations that practice it to uh, you know, uh, remain in the territory of the state. Mm -hmm. um, and um, to encourage, where appropriate, uh, multiracialism and multiracial uh, organizations. Um, it is strong uh, against hate speech, very strong. Um, and uh, it, um, focuses on, uh, you know, political rights, civil rights, economic, social, and cultural uh, rights, and the kinds of discrimination that can occur in all of those fields. And it requires uh, that uh, the government take actions, special actions, to create 
equality in those fields where it does not exist. Special measures, concrete measures, affirmative action. Uh, and it is very strong uh, in that way as well. It, 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 it calls on states to make sure that uh, people and populations that are subjected to uh, racism have um, a uh, remedy and have a forum that they could uh, you know, go to for that remedy. And that goes all the way from the sort of foolishness that went on around uh, Breonna Taylor's uh, murder and the lack uh, of the, 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 the great amount of uh, discretion given to prosecutors uh, to decide you know, who pays the penalty and who does not. Um, you know, so this, uh, you know, the international laws are there. Uh, and, and, and CERT that oversees this uh, convention also has a special uh, general recommendation on uh, the prevention of uh, racial discrimination in uh, the functioning of criminal justice systems. That's as detailed, as thorough as you could ever want. Now, uh, the issue is how do we get that implemented? Uh, it's been overlooked, not just in the era of Trump, it's been overlooked in all eras. <laughs> uh, so this is our uh, challenge, uh, along with centering structural racism in all of the uh, attempts that we make to create um, some real and meaningful change. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for those introductory remarks. And that's a good segue uh, to Mr. Clement Voulet, who can offer us a perspective on, uh, from international law perspective on the freedom of expression. Thank you very much. Uh, let me begin by thanking the organizer of this uh, important event. I'm honored to connect with you today and share this panel with such a distinguished group of colleagues and friends. I particularly want to reiterate my solidarity with George Floyd family. Seven years, 70 year, 75 years, sorry, after the establishment of the United Nations and almost 20 years since the adoption of the Durban Declaration and Program of Action, we find ourselves still discussing the scoring of racism against African and people of African descent around the world. African and people of African descent living in every continent continue to face discrimination and racial, racially motivated violence. They continue to be arbitrarily killed by police. Their demand for freedom and equal and equal continue to be criminalized and aggressively policed. In the month of June, I expressed my grievous concern about the crackdown of racial justice demonstration that spread across the United, United States in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd and Brona Taylor. I stress that police abuse and excessive use of force during peaceful assembly are unacceptable at any time, but are especially distressing when demonstrators are precisely calling for accountability on police brutality and systemic racism in policing. What has become clear is that we cannot separate the repression of this peaceful protest from the structural racism and the exclusion, persecution, and marginalization that come with it. But the crackdown of this protest will not silence the renewed global movement for racial justice. 
it only reaffirms the urgency of this global struggle. The nonviolent Black Lives Matter protest movements is the Mandela protest and civil disobedience campaign of our lifetime. It is a just cause that will ultimately prevail. That is why I strongly reject all attempts to delegitimize and promote hostility towards the Black Lives Matter movement or racial justice protests around the world. This movement is a remarkable example of a historically discriminated community seeking equality through peaceful means. This movement represents a hope for the future of democracy and the value of the United Nations and the Durban Platform of Action. Governments around the world have the obligation under international law to protect and promote the rights of the anti-racism movement to organize and hold peaceful protests. The international community should hold governments accountable for failing their duty. Resolution 43-1 of the Human Rights Council recognize this and call for concrete action to end systemic racism violation of international human rights law against African and, Af and people of African descent by law enforcement agency. I'm reminded of the wall of Nelson Mandela when he addressed the General Assembly for, first, for the first time in 1990. Recounting the crime of the apartheid, he stressed that, I quote, it, it will forever remain an accusation and a challenge to all men and women of conscience that it took as long as it has before all of us stood up to say enough is enough. What can we say about our current moment? UN member states are still failing to confront racial injustice, particularly against African and people of African descent. To merely condemn acts of racism was not enough then, and is simply absurd now. We need to move beyond commitments into action and accountability. This is what the resolution 43 slash one called for. And I hope that through our discussion today, we will be able also to inform, but also to ensure that the world understand that this resolution must be implemented in a way that we end this systematic racism in the US, but all over the world. I thank you and I hope for our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now turning it over to Jamil Dakwar to offer the perspective from civil society. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Christina, for, uh, for the introduction. And, and I want to thank uh, my colleagues and my, uh, all the other co-sponsoring organizations for uh, holding this event. Um, I, I would like to focus a little more about on uh, what was happening in the United States and maybe link it to uh, an important event just in the opening remarks that will happen next week, uh, which, um, which is the Universal Periodic Review of the United States. Uh, but let me start with some, some very uh, troubling data and statistics that many people probably heard before, but I think it's important to repeat that. Um, from January 1st, 2015 to June 30th, 2020, just in the last five years or so, police officers shot and killed 5,442 people in the United States. According to a study that we did, the ACLU with outside researchers, uh, and confirmed by other studies as well, Black, Native Americans, or Indigenous peoples, and Latinx people are more likely to be fatally shot than white people. Uh, and what also was revealing is that fatal police shootings continued the same as always, even during COVID in the last few months. Black people in particular are uh, disproportionately impacted. Uh, they are uh, three times more likely uh, to be shot by police than white people. Indig indigenous people are two and a half times more likely to be shot by, by police. 
so these these statistics are just reflecting the modern uh, or the the recent uh, policing practices. But American policing in general has never been really a neutral institution. As I think mentioned by Gay and others, uh, the first U.S. city police department was a slave patrol. Uh, and, and subsequently modern police forces have directed oppression and violence at black people to enforce Jim Crow, uh, wage the war on drugs and crack down on protests. Uh, the, the recent uh, killing and horrific murder of George Floyd sparked a global movement uh, demanding concrete and bold actions to end racist policing practices and impunity for police violence. Uh, this is not just uh, in the United States. Uh, we were really heartened by the many, many organizations around the world who, who answered our call to call for a special uh, inquiry, for an independent commission of inquiry following the killing of George Floyd and many other Black women, women and men. And because this is an issue that is also impacting many other Black people around the world. And we've seen uh, things happening from Brazil to Nigeria, where there's a, a recent protest and horrific crackdown on protesters because of the, their responses to brutality of the SARS um, unit. And in many other places, including in the Middle East, I worked uh, before joining the ACLU and Human Rights Watch, I worked at Adala, uh, which is a human rights organization in Israel, and I worked on uh, impunity for police violence against Palestinians. But uh, if we go back to the United States, we are one day before uh, not only one of the most consequential elections, but perhaps would be the most contentious um, US elections. Uh, the eyes of the world are, uh, are going to be on whether the United States will preserve uh, the democratic integrity of the elections. Uh, these elections are not consequential just because Trump's authoritarianism and the damage that he caused to our basic democratic freedoms and human rights. But it's also critical because the last few years, which started under actually the Obama administration, thanks to the Black Lives Matter movement, people in the United States had to grapple with the entrenched systemic racism, especially in the context of policing. A week from today, uh, the US human rights record will be reviewed by the, U U by the Human Rights Council as part of a unique UN mechanisms known as the Universal Periodic Review. This will be the third time the United States will be reviewed since 2010. The United States UPR report, which was released uh, just a few weeks ago, is one of the worst attempts uh, to cover up US human rights violations since the civil rights movement. The report, for example, dismiss, dismisses the well-documented system, systemic racism in American policing and makes no mention of the long list of abuses and failures to uphold human rights, including the US government violent crackdown on protesters on all level, the federal, state, and local levels. Now, the issue of racist policing and structural racism in the criminal legal system, especially against people of African descent, is going to be the center of the UN review next Monday. Um, in a statement that will be issued later today by several US-based civil society organizations, who were involved in the UPR process under the US Human Rights Network Working Group on Policing on the Criminal Legal System and the Working Group on People of African Descent. Uh, those organizations that are addressing many injustices in, in our criminal legal system will call for international vigilance and explicit attention and action to the structures of oppression in the United States that marginalize and criminalize people of African descent and violate both their human rights as well as their civil rights under the US Constitution. The demand for, act, for action, attention and action to the inherent anti-Black racism in the criminal legal system is also shared. Uh, we share the analysis that you heard uh, uh, by Professor Akiomi, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Racism, which uh, who in the, in the context of uh, the last summer historic debate before the Human Rights Council, said um, specifically, she offered um, that where racial injustice is most rampant is where a country has failed to undo structures of racism originating in colonialism and transatlantic slave trade. 
So as such, we uplift indigenous people, migrants, and other marginalized communities who are harmed by our country's policies and institutions like the criminal legal system designed to uphold and protect white supremacy. Uh, in that same statement, we are convinced uh, we're, that the root causes when uh, that only when the root causes of injustices are explicitly acknowledged can they be meaningfully addressed. And therefore, in this critical period of mass uprising and global reckoning with anti-Black racism, accompanied by a call to fundamentally reimagine policing, surveillance, and imprisonment, we are encouraging every UN member state to make explicit references to the ways the United States criminal legal system is designed to disproportionately harm people of African descent, particularly those who exist at the intersections of marginalization. And I wanna highlight those, in, those groups. Black people with disabilities, black women and black people with marginalized genders, black people living in poverty, black sex workers and people in survival economies, as well as the black youth who are leading the Black Lives Matter movement. We're also urging the strongest possible calls and recommendations with regard to the following anti-Black practices and policies of the US criminal legal system. Uh, systema uh, address particularly systema systemic racism and violence of, po of policing and incarceration, including a, a, of killing of Black people at the disproportionate rate, mass incarceration, and the use of incommunicado detention. We also call to uh, specifically address and take measures to end excessive and disproportionate sentences like life imprisonment, uh, life without parole, or death by incarceration sentences, the death penalty, which disproportionately apply to Black people in the United States, and all forms of torture or cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment or punishment, including prolonged solitary confinement. We're also calling for the ending of the criminalization of Black people protesting and organizing for racial justice and the re release of civil rights era political prisoners, many of whom were targeted by the US government widely, widely discredited con uh, pro program and now belong to the vulnerable demographic of elderly and aging people in prison. Urging the creation of an international commission of inquiry to investigate systemic anti-Black racism and police violence in the United States is an imperative. It is really important to, to continue to push for that, even though the recent resolution that was cited earlier, resolution 53-1, only called for a report by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And finally, I would like to highlight the importance of centering the international decade for people of African descent, which started in 2015 and will go till, till 2024, with its themes of recognition, justice, and development as an another effective tool to address and dismantle systemic racism and all other systems that are incompatible with realization of human rights for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamil, for offering some of the possible solutions, which we definitely want to delve further in, um, in this discussion today. I want to turn the discussion back to Mr. Floyd. You gave powerful congressional and UN testimonies shortly after your brother George's death. We were wondering if you could discuss the impact of police violence on surviving family members. You spoke about that a, a little bit earlier, but if you could tell us specifically about the emotional toll and trauma of reliving and retelling the horrifying stories while trying to bring about structural systemic change. Oh, oh uh, the day I, um, went to the funeral, I didn't even have time to grieve. I left and went straight to Washington to uh, sit right before Capitol Hill, at Capitol Hill to plead with them to hope that they can pass the George Floyd Justice 20 to 20, 20 Act. I'm sorry right now, you know, I'm kind of sleepy a little bit, but <laughs> I'm going, but, Everything that's going on with my family, uh, we're here together. We're trying our best to physically get through every day because when I'm around the kids, they always ask questions. They ask questions all the time and they ask why. I just left Orlando, I'm not Orlando, but Florida, 
other little kids was asking me questions about my brother because they were concerned and they wanted to know whether or not would they be able to live because that's the next generation. Um, the things about what's going on with the pandemic, COVID is one of the biggest reasons that my brother has a chance right now. But I really can't say too much on that because of what's going on with the Breonna Taylor issue because she had proof. They had footage. Eric Garner, he had footage. My brother has footage, but who to say that it's gonna go the way we want it to go? It's a big thing about hoping. You go to Rodney King, he had footage, but nothing happened. So me personally, running around, my biggest thing is we need to get this Justice for Floyd Act in because we don't need no more chokeholds. That's how my brother and Eric Garner were killed. You go with Breonna Taylor, the no-knock warrants. You need this bill to be passed. You have the dashboards and people walking around with the cameras. You need this because these guys, they're not keeping the cameras on. They don't need qualified immunity. We need to get these guys considerably. We need to get them in the right way. We need to be able to put these cops in jail if they're doing the things that they are doing to people. Jacob Blake was shot seven times. My family, we talk to each other. We worry a lot because my brother is gone. It's bigger than my brother now because who would think that the same thing will consistently just keep happening after you see a man tortured to death like a fish suffocating in water, out of water. That's, that's a painful thing. It's a painful event. And this has been a year where Blacks have been losing their lives to COVID. And people are scared to go outside. They're scared to go anywhere. People had to sit and watch the video. That's the only thing positive that COVID had on this world is people were, were able to sit still and actually had a chance to see what systemic racism is and everything. As, as a black man going outside every day, I worry, will I be able to come home? People have to understand that coming out this year, when it's coming out to vote, you have to know that Breonna Taylor is on the ballot. George Floyd, he's on the ballot. Um, Sandra Bland is on the ballot. Uh, Pellerin is on the ballot. It's so many different people that's on this ballot because the blood is on the ballot right now. I just need everybody around the nation to understand that we can come together. We just need the right leader to put us there because we know what we want, but we cannot make people do what we want them to do. My brother, every day I wake up and I think about him. I think about all the positive things that we did together, like fishing, dancing with our mom, just, just the little things and me fighting for him every day, going from state to state, uh, just going from pole to pole. People, they show up and they all tell me that they understand and how bad they feel, but they won't change. And I need people to get out and be the change. They have to get out and vote. Racism, it's among us. You got good cops. You got good people, you got bad cops, you got bad people, you shouldn't have to sort them out. People should be able to understand that life is precious and you shouldn't take it away for anything. Like I told you, the guy was on my brother Nick for eight minutes and 46 seconds with his hands in his pockets, just looking at him. 
And he was talking to him as my brother cried and pleaded. And he was even, he said, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Then he started talking about my mom. That hurt me and it hurt a lot of other mothers around the nation. I just need people to open their eyes and understand what's going on. Ben Crump said all the time, it's two pandemics. It's black America and it's white America. It shouldn't be like that. I don't see a color. I just see people of color. I don't see colors. Every day I walk down the street I shake people's hands, not just the human beings that are above, homeless people. I talk to them. I get on knees and speak with them and give them money, give them food, because I want to see people. I want to see people. I don't want to see dead people. Me, I'm glad you all gave me this chance because what y'all have to understand is this has been a year where people have actually woke up and started seeing systemic racism. They've been seeing black and brown killed daily, yearly. It's just, it's impossible right now. It's impossible to live here in the United States and think that you can survive. That's, that's the way that this world is right now. Every day, it don't matter if it's a, a man or a woman. They're killing you. Police officers are killing you. Um, racism is above the level that I seen it when I was coming up. Um, I don't know. I was, honestly, me, if it's like every other day, it don't matter what state you go to. Um, I can go certain places down the street and I'll see a rally and people be having Trump, 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 Trump and keep Trumping. And I don't have nothing against Trump, but I just understand that a lot of people have their own views. Like me, I have my own views in life. I just want people to understand again that life is precious and people have to understand that Breonna Taylor, she should still be here. George Floyd should still be here. Eric Garner should still be here. Jacob Blake was shot seven times in his back. He should still be able to walk. This, this is difficult just thinking about it. Like I was just telling you earlier, those three guys I had named, they were all killed by the same officer and he's still there. He's still there. It's, you have to go back to Trayvon Martin. It's racism, it's here, it's out. I just don't know where it is, but it's here. Um, I just, just, just what has been, of, what has been um, the reaction of the lawmakers when you've been discussing the George Floyd Act? Has that been well received? You know, I don't think it's been well received yet. For one reason, is it hasn't been passed. It has to be passed because you have to show me. I hear things over and over and over again, but I haven't seen it yet. When my brother passed, they should have passed that whole entire bill because it will show you that other people's lives matter. I'm telling you, you have so many laws up under that umbrella, so many laws that can be passed to help people. People should not they be able to drive down the street and when they see an officer coming, they're nervous to even pull over. 
because they don't know what's going to happen. People want to be able to go home. People, they want to be able to see their kids. It's, it's difficult. Um, I talk to police officers all the time because they recognize me and they tell me, hey, I wouldn't do that to you. You know, they tell me that, hey, man, I love you. They just tell me things like that. But like I just told you, you got good officers, you have bad officers. You shouldn't have to sort them out because you don't know who they are. Um, I went to uh, first responders and uh, event when it was a police officer and a firefighter. They were killed. And one officer, he was killed. It was two weeks before he retired. 65, I knew him through my neighborhood. And he, he also went to the same high school that me and George went to. It was difficult knowing that I knew him and he was a, a really great person. And he was the police officer. He was shot in the head. The 14, a 14 year old boy told him that, hey, my dad has a gun. And he went there to check. And when he opened the door, just like that, shot him in the head, he was killed. What people got to understand is that's somebody dad, that's somebody brother, that's somebody uncle, that's somebody cousin. And the same thing, when they asked me about it, I told them, hey, I know they have the same pain that I have. I know they're hurting. And I know they want justice. And I want the same thing they want. And that's the way I feel about everything. Lives matter. Lives matter. Not just black lives. Lives matter. In this world, it just, it's terrible. In this world, what we got to think about is you look up and I'm thinking about a show that I watched with National Geographic and they were showing the bald eagle and the bald eagle, they were explaining about it. And it said that the bald eagle was an endangered species, but they made federal laws to protect that bird. So if they make federal laws to protect the bird, they can make federal laws to protect people of color. That's all I'm asking for. I just want to be able to live, enjoy my life, and give others the same. And when I say the same, I want them to have the same values that I have. Because talking to Eric Garner's mom, my mom has passed. That's a lot of pain. She's hurting. She hurts a lot. I get four and five hours of sleep. When I went there to do that speech in Congress, it was nothing for me to get up there and do it. But when I got up there and just started rolling and rolling, I completely just froze up after a little while because I started thinking about my brother. Have you all ever had somebody pass that you all hurt from? That's the way I feel. I feel the same way, the same way you have a loved one. I feel the same way. And we all have to stick together. That's the only way we can get these officers and get these the right leaders in office, not just the president and the vice president. We got to focus on councilmen. We got to focus on everybody because we have to do the right things to get the right people in. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, I want to I wanna shift over to Jasmine Rand, and I know you, you spoke a little bit about this in your introductory remarks, but we're hoping you could tell us a little bit more about your experience as a leading human rights lawyer representing victim families, and if you can comment on some of the institutional obstacles that you've encountered. You spoke about the role of police unions, could you tell us a little bit more about qualified immunity, the lack of independent investigations, and so forth? Yeah, and I think, you know, 
Gay McDougall made such a great point when, when she was speaking um, and talking about structural racism. And that when we're looking at this problem and trying to deal with it in a vacuum of just looking at police reform, we're really missing the point because police brutality is just one mechanism of many mechanisms of death in this country and mechanisms of death that are really weapons aimed directly at black and brown people. And so, you know, I think it's, we have a lot of, you know, brilliant minds who are on this panel with me who are out there listening in the audience. And so I think that that's something that we really have to keep in, in focus is that structural racism is a predecessor to police brutality, not really the other way around. And so if we're not addressing structural racism really from the ground up, then we're not doing much to push the gamut of police brutality. And as I, I, as I talked before, you know, there are several um, legal reform mechanisms that we can put in place to, to give attorneys like myself a fighting chance, at least when we're, we're dealing um, with this system, things like ending qualified immunity, um, which makes, uh, you know, puts up a barrier to, to holding people and, and police officers and departments accountable in the courtroom. We need to look at independent um, prosecutions. And oftentimes what happens, especially in smaller communities, towns, and even in, in cities, is that you know these people are all working together on a daily basis. The police officers that are doing the shooting, the prosecutors, the medical examiners, they know each other, they work together and often cover for one another instead of holding each other accountable. And that's why things like independent prosecutions are important. As I mentioned earlier, um, you know, independent autopsies are equally as important. Benjamin Crump and myself, uh, Often our firms will fund independent autopsies on behalf of our clients, but most people and most attorneys are not going to be able to put up, you know, anywhere from three to ten thousand uh, dollars to get an independent medical examination to prove, you know, the cause of death, uh, which is also often a barrier, uh, a barrier to being able to to bring forward a successful case criminally and also civilly. And so those are some of the mechanisms, direct mechanisms that we have, and. Uh, changes that we can make within our systems to give us a better chance in, in the civil rights world at, at accountability. But if we don't deal with the underlying structural racism, then, um, you know, as Gay said, we're going to be spinning our wheels. We're not, we're not getting very far if we can't um, really do that. Because I say all the time, you know, we can write the most beautiful black letter law. But if we have judges who have inequitable principles in their minds and in their hearts, you're going to always have inequitable outcomes, no matter how beautiful the law we write. Um, and, and we really see that, as I said earlier, with, with racism and, and, and murder committed not just by police, but by white citizens. And those white citizens are not accountable for killing black people. So, you know, those, the, 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 the statistics that Jamil gave us at the ACLU looked at in terms of the police killings, that's one um, aspect of the, the, the number of deaths that, that Black people are facing at the hands of police. But there's another pool of statistics. I don't know what the numbers would be, but there's a whole other pool of statistics for Black people killed by white citizens, um, you know, acting in this quasi police capacity. And, you know, it's part of our historic context here in the United States, as, as, as Jamil pointed out and as, as Gay pointed out, that this has been a, a pattern. Um, from the inception of our nation that's never ended. And I think in many people's minds, um, in many people's minds, there's this point in history where Black people got a break, where there was an end to violence, where things were at some point equal. And I think in people's minds, sometimes that's after the 1950s and 60s, and then there was a break and everything was okay. And then, you know, this other horrific event comes along and we have Rodney King and then everything's better again. And now, you know, we're in the midst of the Black Lives Matter movement when in reality, um, this type of behavior has never ended. There's never been uh, a break for black or brown people in this nation and there's never been equality. And I just wanna say, and I know it's a bit off topic, but it's something that's really important to me. Um, ben Crump and I are, we're working on a lot of projects together right now. And the one thing that's my, I'm very passionate about and Ben is very passionate about is what is the future of justice? Because we spend so much time figuring out how to stop um, I'll use just the example of, of black men and women from getting shot in the back. We spend so much of our time focusing on that, 
that we're, we're not keeping our eyes on the prize and what is full and true equality. And so that's something that I think is important as leaders, we think about, you know, audience members, we, we think about um, is it, keeping our eye on the prize of what it means to be, to have an equal opportunity in every aspect of life in this nation and education and healthcare and access to housing um, and access to the polls and, and, and expressing, you know, a person's right to vote that every single aspect of black life in America is oppressed and that fighting you know, Ben and I have been talking about this concept that it's not enough to stop black men from getting shot in the back. It's about shooting them to the moon. It's about giving black people equal access at every single space that we have here in this world. And, you know, even as far as space technology, how do we make black people equal and, and, and competitive in, in space technology? How do we take countries um, that don't have those opportunities and make them equal and competitive in those ways? And so I know that it sounds very pie in the sky to discuss these things in that forum when we're dealing with the reality of trying to stop black people from getting shot in the back in the United States on a daily basis, but also as leaders and, as leaders and um, global citizens, we have to constantly keep our eyes on what is the future of justice and what is true equality because we can't spend all of our time working on this level here. We have to you know, project into the future of what we want our nation to really look like for black and brown life. Thank you very much. Very insightful. I wanna uh, turn it over to Professor McDougall. If you could let us know your views on what are the obligations of states arising from international law in connection with racial profiling, law enforcement brutality, systemic racism, and the freedom of expression. What are the lasting effects of racial profiling and law enforcement brutality on people of African descent globally? What are the obligations of states uh, in that regard? Um, as I read uh, to you the provisions from the International Convention Against Racism, uh, the obligation that states take is to bring to an end immediately all acts of racial discrimination uh, by any individual, organization, or entity. That, that's pretty sweeping, right? Bring to an end immediately all acts of racial discrimination by any individual, by uh, any entity, organization, or state. That, that's pretty sweeping. That, that I think is, uh, and Clement, you can check me on this. That is a broader obligation with respect to a right than you find in any other human rights document. And generally, uh, you know, that's is more limited to uh, what a state does itself and doesn't do, et cetera. But this is sweeping. And, you know, um, I wish I could say that we're getting, um, we're getting implementation that somehow matches <laughs> the sweeping nature of the uh, international obligation, but we're not. Uh, of course, we're not getting much in terms of um, of uh, implementation to of international legal obligations in general, you know. But I I I really think that we have to um, we have to hold the UN accountable at this point. Uh, you know, I mean that 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 was a predecessor organization to the UN, the League of Nations. Um, and I remember being in Geneva uh, many years ago and seeing the building that the League of Nations met in and it was all boarded up and ransacked and 
it was a manifestation to me. It, it, it really symbolized um, how that organization fell apart. And what did it fall apart on? The issue was um, self-determination of peoples of color. You know, it's a very racist organization. And it decided, for example, that there are certain uh, groups of people who just weren't quite ready or up to us, uh, you know, being given the, uh, uh, the uh, responsibility of governing themselves. So they made colonies around the world. They made Palestine into a colony. They made Namibia into a colony. They made Western Sahara into a colony. And it, they still are in, you know, troubled waters to this day. But we, we've got to, we've got to call the UN on carpet as well. You know, other organizations, world organizations have, have uh, been pitched into <laughs> uh, the garbage over their inability uh, to deal with the concept of racial equality. You know, so uh, the UN has to be called a, because, you know, what happened when uh, uh, the resolution was put forward <clears throat> in June? I said a lot about uh, where the UN is right now, uh, you know, it was put forward, we got to put forward by the largest group of uh, states, largest block, the Africa group, the four countries. Um, and um, one country started threatening and bullying countries in, in, in the hallways. If you don't take the name of my country out of your resolution, you know, if you don't, you know, you just, you can't, you can't mention us, you can't uh, call us on the carpet. We can't have an organization, world organization that is, is given the responsibility of protecting uh, <coughs> you know, peace and security in the world. And all of that can be bullied by one country in the hallways. We've got to call the UN on the carpet. Sorry. Thank you very much. Did I answer the question? No, absolutely. <laughs> that was, yeah, that was great. Um, my next question is for Jamil. What is the current state of play with regard to the effort to reform police institutions? Specifically, there have been calls to divest from police institutions and to reallocate resources. Where does the ACLU stand on this issue and what's the current status of this discussion? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, you know, as, as many uh, or as some, some of the panelists have said, particularly Jasmine and, and Gay and Professor McDougall, uh, the police reform has been on the agenda for decades. Uh, there were a lot of attempts to do that on the federal, state, on local level. A lot of people, well, very well-meaning people wanted to do good things, but it just never got off the ground and never really protected particularly black and brown communities. And so in the last uh, few months, uh, and I think sparked by the protests uh, against the brutality uh, and the torture to death of George Floyd and other uh, killings and led by the protesters, really the demand uh, was made a more magnified by Black Lives Matter movement protesters uh, that it is, should be a shift uh, from continuing to demand policing reform into something that would be more radical. There's a time now, it's about time 
that we reimagine what policing should look like, reconsider and revisit the role of policing in democratic society, particularly in the United States. That should, of course, be a part of the reckoning with our history um, of, of decades and centuries old structural racism. And that has to happen and has to start happening at all levels. And that's where the ACLU has been supporting and echoing the demand for divesting from police departments and reinvesting in life affirming alternatives. You look at police departments like NYPD that has over a billion dollar budget that is while other important services are being cut. Uh, you heard earlier about the, the implications from um, on, on black community of uh, the, how COVID exacerbated racial disparities. Uh, if you think about it, if we had more resources devoted instead of policing black and brown communities, but rather building infrastructure that will help communities to thrive, to have act equal and affordable and quality access to medic medical care, to education, quality education, to empl employment, housing, or all other uh, uh, services that are should should not be a kind of thing that you'll have to to negotiate, but rather should be given to you as, as as someone who lives in a country, particularly in a country that is one of the most the wealthiest country on earth. So we are standing today in a juncture where there's a movement calling for that shift. It is, it is not going to also end by just calling to divest from police. I think there's continuing demand for uh, transforming, for example, the use of force laws uh, and bring them in line with international norms. Uh, a lot of times you see that police departments uh, have uh, uh, procedures and protocols for the use of force that is not in line with even our federal uh, laws that should be scrutinized, that should be brought in line with international norms. For example, the Peace Act, which could, would be a first step in the right direction, would require law enforcement to use force only when necessary proportion and less extreme alternatives have been exhausted. This is something that is, is should be given. This is how uh, other countries are dealing with policing. And they're not dealing with policing as a first resort. It's not, the police should not be the first institution that you call to solve your problems, which we see in many, many communities. Uh, so for example, we need to make sure that there are alternatives for uh, to police response for people in crisis, um, especially people with mental health issues. Uh, we've seen that just recently, uh, where uh, 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 again, black man was killed by the police, uh, was, was shot in front of their family members, but he had, he, he was in a crisis. Instead of pulling the trigger and easily execute someone, uh, there should have been another way to keep him alive and should have been, he should have been alive today. We're also seeing the militarization of police departments that happened particularly after 9-11, something that is very concerning and troubling. Uh, and that has happened because the Department of Defense under a federal program called the 1033 program fuels the militarization of law enforcement by arming local and state police uh, uh, and, and making them look like soldiers and like some, some people who are going into a battlefield. And so that has to end. There has to be an end to the militarization of police. And then the other, other additional uh, things that we have been calling for is uh, something that Jasmine pointed out, independent oversight structures uh, with teeth. I mean, there are, there are no independent investigations, but also the existing oversight mechanisms that were created, like for example, civilian over, over, uh, oversight boards, most of them don't have teeth. They've been uh, uh, sidestepped by, side by, mm -hmm. by, by, um, by law enforcement agencies and by politicians who, who are in power. We also have, uh, a, we have, we have to start collect data uh, in much better way. Uh, particularly police shootings and killings. Uh, there's no federal uh, one source where you can look at. There are other non-governmental sources, uh, The Guardian, The Washington Post, uh, mapping police killing, other kind of sources, but we don't really have a one place where you, and where you can really find information to hold the police departments accountable. 
The same with enforcing a law that was passed uh, several years ago, the Death in Custody Reporting Act. Uh, that has not been enforced, that has not been implemented to obtain and publish data on deadly force. And finally, I would end with uh, particularly, uh, well, one thing I want to ask, one, one important thing is to end the so-called war on drugs. This is something that has created a lot of problems, particularly the way that police has been instrumental in, in, in policing communities of color. But finally, I would, would end with the call to support HR 40, which is the new the legislation that is now sponsored by over 150, I believe, uh, members of Congress that are calling uh, to establish a commission to examine the institution of slavery and its impact uh, and make recommendations for reparations to Congress. Because ultimately the history of racist policing and law enforcement brutality against black people in the United States and the uh, appropriate remedies to repair the damage and historic injustice must be at the center of any debate or discussion about reparations. And I think we have a chance at this juncture to do the right thing by pushing for um, policies and laws that protect people and, and, and their dignity, but at the same time reckoning and addressing historic injustices and atrocities, particularly against black people. Thank you. Thank you, Jamil. Um, I'm noting some digital focus questions coming in from the audience in the chat. So I want to segue the discussion briefly on the role of digital technologies in protests and maybe finish with a question to Special Rapporteur Voulet. Um, Mr. Voulet, in your role as Special Rapporteur, you rightfully continue to delve into this intersection of freedom of association and assembly and digital technologies, so protesting in the digital age. Uh, this is most notable in your 2019 thematic report to the UN Human Rights Council. In light of the discussion today, we're wondering what impacts do emerging technologies have on the exercise of the right to process? Uh, we have one question in the chat on the surveillance of Black Lives Matter and other activists. And if you can add in what further monitoring or normative guidance may be needed, um, including as it pertains to the role of the private sector, uh, greatly appreciated and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, let me say that I'm, I'm really concerned about the increased digital surveillance uh, targeting the Black Lives Matter movement and, and, uh, and anti-racism protests, such as facial recognition uh, technology and sophisticated hacking tools that we are seeing. And because this exacerbated the existing risk and marginalization of many of their members. We know that African and Afri African and African Afro descent around the world experience overwhelming police presence in their communities and face routine harassment by law enforcement. We know this technology reinforce existing bias and prejudice. But also, I'm very concerned about the spread of uh, disinformation and hate speech campaign targeting the movement and its members. These campaigns have been appearing on social media and around promoting, which are promoted by white supremacy in attempt to create division and exacerbate tension. I've seen both campaigns that promote hate against the movement and other more sophisticated tie to steal the voice of the movement and promote sentiments of violence. So you ask what can be done? Let me say that I think it's important and I reiterate that in my, in my report on uh, 2019, states need to start banning facial recognition technology during peaceful protest and imposing a moratorium on the export surveillance digital technology. Currently, the use of this technology does not comply with international human rights standard because they are disproportionately used and the data that they collect without the consent of people that they are collecting their data. So it's important that they impose moratorium on that. They can also, for example, regulate 
social media companies to ensure they comply with their obligation to, to human rights to diligence. Companies can do more and better for all of us. And I think it's important to also ensure that the legitimate action of the, this black matter is not used by certain people to promote a hate speech. Because we saw that many people trying to use this legitimate action to, to pertain it as a movement that is violent. But we know by experience that most, in most places that where this movement spread around the world, the violence can when the police start reacting. The violence when police starts using excessive force. And it's important for you and also, and I reiterate that many times, to recognize these movements. It's important that you and promote this movement. Because I want also to mention something that this movement since 2015 achieved more than any institution put in place to implement the Durban Declaration and the plast, uh, and, uh, and action uh, and, and action uh -huh. and action plan. We need to recognize that. And this fighting against systemic racism is a core of the UN mandate. And we should mm -hmm. make sure that we promote this movement because these movements are important and they show that by using peaceful protests, they can achieve more and they will call all of us to the task. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Boulay. It seems we have unfortunately run short on time, but hope the audience really appreciated the powerful and the thought provoking statements from the panelists and want again to thank the panelists for joining us today. Uh, we also wanted to note that we've collected the many questions that we've received on the Q&A and we will share them with the panelists and encourage the panelists to share their contact information if possible. Uh, feel free to use the hashtags noted in the chat to propose further questions and continue the conversation um, in the future. I want to thank you all for joining us, thanking our co-sponsors, co-organizers, and everyone. Um, please stay safe and be well. Uh, hello? <laughs> oh. It's finished. Yeah. Uh, no, oh, I please. wanted to uh, tell you all one thing that I learned when I was in Tallahassee. Um, they had some protesters because I went down there on a foundation event and those protesters were put in jail for protesting and they didn't do anything. But the police officers down there, they are allowed to like pull you, push you, do what they want. But if you like touch them, it's, it's considered assault. And they, they put a lot of them in jail. A lot of them went to jail and they're trying to give, I think it's two of them, 10 years for protesting. And to me, that's, that's, that's not right. I thought we were here for put on this land for freedom of speech and for something like that to happen. That's, 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 that's not right at all. Cause I was with these night. I was with these people last night and they were all on a dinner with us. And I wanted to show them how much I cared about them because they didn't have to go out and protest. People all around the world protested and people went to jail and incarcerated. But my thing is, I'm so sorry. And to anybody that can hear this, please, please. I know that they don't forgive you, but I forgive you for everything. I love you all. I just, I was, I cried last night talking to them and holding them because they didn't have to do what they did. They protested for my brother. They didn't even know my brother. They knew that that was wrong. And two of them are facing 10 years and they didn't do anything. 10 years just for holding a sign, protesting. And now in Florida, they don't want you to protest because they're gonna give you a felony if you do it. You're gonna get a felony. And yeah. It's not right. Well, thank, yeah, thank you for sharing that with us. And you know, we're following this in the news and it's all the more reason why we have to 
keep on at every possible level, national and also before the UN. Um, mm -hmm. So we're really incredibly grateful for you sharing your views and our hearts go out to you and to your family. And thank you again for sharing your story. And thank you to all of our excellent panelists for sharing their different perspectives, domestic and international, uh, personal and political, because it's all very much tied together. So thank you again. And let's please keep the discussion going. Take care, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.